Thank you, Dr. Moeller, for those very kind words. Thank you for the invitation to preach. And thank you and Mary for your many wonderful kindnesses to me, both private and uh, with others in the past 19 years. I'll never forget them. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for saying words that I could hardly believe, words that I can hardly believe when they come out of my mouth and I say tomorrow I will be 70 years old. Now that also gives me the opportunity to say, and I wouldn't want to steal all the glory on that today because Dr. Greg Allison will turn 70 tomorrow as well. And I know him well enough to know right now he's saying, oh boy, here we go. Uh, but I want you to know that uh, he will turn 70 tomorrow morning. I, d I was born in the evening, so I will not turn 70 until tomorrow night. So he is older than I am. And in a classic case of when age comes before beauty, uh, when you see him tomorrow, tell him not only happy Valentine's Day, but ask him, how does it feel to be in your eighth decade, uh, knowing that Dr. Whitney is still in his seventh uh, decade? <laughs> it's, it's great to be able to joke like that with beloved colleagues. I love Dr. Allison so much and all of my colleagues here, the men and women I serve with, our wonderful staff, uh, having done so now 19 years. And what a privilege to be in a place where uh, you work with people you love so much. And I, I trust you know I really mean that uh, when I say that. But I wanted to call attention to the fact that I am turning 70 because, uh, you know, you never know when something you're going to do is going to be the very last time. Uh, but especially when you're 70, you think about that a lot more uh, than you used to. And it came to me, if this were the last time I were to fill this pulpit, what would I want to say? What would God want me to say? And so I have um, been directed, I believe, through much thought and prayer to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. But it just comes to my mind looking at you how like yesterday, I can remember sitting in my seminary classes, listening to professors in chapel, how, how quickly that passes. And um, if I dwell on that much longer, I'm going to be uh, like Dr. Moeller in his famous convocation address who at 11.20, not 10.20, at 11.20 said, I have 10 more points. <laughs> but it was a great, great, very short class I had with my students afterward. <laughs> what a wonderful place God has given us. How grateful we are to be here for our colleagues, our leadership, and for the Word of God. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for this place. Thank you for these people. Thank you for your indescribable gift in Jesus, for the ability to gather as a seminary community and hear your Word opened. And so in his name now, we ask your blessing on this time. Amen. Almost everyone knows someone who used to be in the ministry. Almost everyone knows someone who shouldn't be in the ministry. And almost every minister knows someone he does not want to be like. 
But the sad news is, for ministers, regardless of your age or education or experience, it's almost inevitable that you will become the kind of minister that today you do not want to become like. So I think it's important to address the subject of the almost inevitable ruin of every minister and how to avoid it. I preached on this text and used that title the first time I filled this pulpit in September of 2005. But I couldn't escape the sense of preaching on this important theme if I were to never preach here again, because I've been so impressed even in recent weeks with the reality of the almost inevitable ruin of every minister. Because the sad reality is of those who graduate from seminary, a very small fraction, by the time they reach retirement age, will still be in the ministry regardless of all the commitment with which they began the race, despite all the investment of time and money to prepare, despite all the years spent in service, despite the cost of retooling and redirecting their lives afterwards, most will leave the ministry. Some will opt out for health reasons. Some will wash out in their private lives. Some will bow out saying, I misread the call of God. Some will bail out because of the stress that's so great. Some will be forced out by their churches. Some will walk out from sheer frustration and a sense of failure. And if you haven't given much thought to leaving the ministry, well, that just tells me you've not been in very long. Despite the fact no one goes into the ministry to be a casualty, the ruin of almost every minister, it seems, is inevitable. For in addition to the high percentage of those who do leave the ministry, of those who remain, sometimes it appears that their ministry effectiveness has been ruined in other ways. They may get ruined by money either the desire for it or the lack of it. They make far too many choices based upon getting more money or else they smolder in their attitude toward their church because they don't get paid enough. Some, of course, will be ruined by sex. And I could give you statistics, but you don't need those. You are well aware of the prevalence of pornography and the crisis in our denomination and most others as well. But long before inappropriate sexual behavior becomes known, it so absorbs the attention of the man that the true impact of his ministry is ruined. Ministers may get ruined by power. They become authoritarian with people. They may not have started out that way. Perhaps they got that way because they were so faithful in one place of ministry for so long that the sin came upon them gradually. Or maybe they discovered that they enjoyed certain sorts of administrative work and after a while they began serving their own political appetites more than Christ. To pull strings was more satisfying than to preach sermons. To get into the inner circle of the right people or to be able to place others in and keep others out of influential positions. To be among the first to get the inside information became the ministry to them. They may get ruined by pride. The greater the influence God gives them, the greater they become in their own sight and the more they believe they deserve the influence. When God first calls them into the ministry, they humbly think, why me? Why me? But after a while, they see larger opportunities open up and they think, why not me? Why not me? Pride may be the sin that both God and people hate the most. 
And regardless of the prideful minister's knowledge or abilities, he isn't loved or admired. He may get the admiration of the ignorant or the undiscerning or those who want to piggyback on his power, but he will not get it from the godly. So they may get ruined by cynicism, money, sex, power, pride, cynicism. When you're around ministers like I've just described, well, no wonder. You hang around guys like that a lot. And when you deal week in and week out with people in your ministry who, who, who claim to be Christians but often don't act like it, when those who are supposed to be God's people talk about you or treat you worse than the world does, or when you've ministered for years and you see little apparent fruit, and these are people to whom you gave your lives. It's easy to become cynical. And you know when it happens, when no one's testimony thrills you anymore, no book motivates you, no sermon moves you anymore. Or you may get ruined surprisingly by money, sex, power, pride, cynicism, or success. Even success, they become CEOs, not shepherds. They become managers, not ministers. And their model is, is, is business with its emphasis on numbers and units and products and marketing and customers rather than a family with its emphasis on new births and growth and love and relationships and maturity or even a farm with its emphasis on sheep and fruit and growing things. In many of these cases then, ruin results in men leaving the ministry, but in many cases they remain. But even then, they become something you don't want to become. You see them politicking their way online or through associational or denominational life, and you say, I don't want to become like that. You overhear their cynicism in conversation, and you say to yourself, I don't ever want to become like that. You perceive their sense of self-importance, and in your mind you say, I don't ever want to become like that. You bring up spiritual matters, and you get a clear sense they'd much rather talk about other things. And you recoil, and you think, I don't ever want to become like that. You hear them preach, and their arrogant attitude, or their worldliness, or their lack of earnestness, or their professionalism, or their desire to be cool, makes you think, I don't ever want to become like that. The sad reality, my brother, is you will become like that. That's you in 20 years, unless you make progress in godliness. There is no middle ground. And it's always been that way. We can go back to the first generation of Christian ministers. And the Apostle Paul was inspired to write these letters we call the pastoral epistles, those letters written to instruct ministers. Even then, already many had been ruined in the ministry. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, there were ministers who had wandered away into vain discussions. Chapter 1, verse 19, some had made shipwreck of their faith. Chapter 4, verse 2, he warned of ministers filled with the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. Chapter 6, verse 4, he told Timothy to watch out for the minister who is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing and has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy dissension, slander, evil suspicion. In chapter 6, verse 5, Paul spoke of the hold money had on these ministers, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. In chapter 6, verses 20 and 21, he warned Timothy to avoid ministers characterized by irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge, for by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. In 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 15, Paul names two ministers who turned away from me. 
Chapter two, verses 16 to 18, he speaks of ministers who, whose talk will spread like gangrene. Then he names two such ministers who have swerved from the truth. In chapter three, verse eight, he warns of men who oppose the truth. In chapter four, verses three and four, Paul speaks of ministers who will teach in accordance to the desires of people who will not endure sound teaching. In Titus, chapter one, verse 10 and 11, he describes many ministers as insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, teaching for shameful gain things they ought not teach. Chapter one, verse 16, he warned of ministers who profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. 13 chapters in the pastoral epistles, 12 of them, 12 times, he warns of those who had been ruined in the ministry. It's almost inevitable, it seems. Paul warned about, Paul warned ministers about these things. He wrote to Timothy and Titus warning them as ministers because ministers had been ruined. It's almost inevitable. And it will happen to you, it will happen to me unless we avoid it by making progress. How do we make progress in ministry instead of making shipwreck? Well, Paul wrote to Timothy and God to us in verse Timothy 4:15 practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. What are these things which if we practice, or as the New American Standard puts it, if we take pains with them and immerse ourselves in them, that all may see your progress. Well, I think in the larger context, these things refers to all the things Paul has written about in the first letter to Timothy and ultimately in all three pastoral epistles. In the immediate context, it is the discipline Paul writes about that he commends to every minister in this chapter, chapter 4, verses 6 to 16. And these are summarized, I believe, in the last verse. Verse 16, keep a close watch on yourself and your teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So in order to make progress in the ministry, as opposed to making shipwreck of his ministry, a minister should keep a close watch on himself and on his teaching. First, keep a close watch on yourself. If you're going to keep a close watch on yourself, then don't let the ministry keep you from Jesus. Don't let the ministry keep you from Jesus. To keep a close watch on yourself here means keep a close watch on yourself as a man of God, as a servant of Christ Jesus. Stay close to him, to grow closer to him, to grow more like him. Notice the references here to man of God and Christ Jesus in these letters. Both 1 Timothy 1 and 2 Timothy 1 begin the same way, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. That's his starting place. And in 1 Timothy 6, 11, he calls Timothy, O oh, man of God, O oh, man of God. In 2 Timothy 3, 17, he reminds him that the scriptures, or God breathed, that the man of God the man of God may be complete, prepared, or equipped for every good work. You can't keep a close watch on yourself without keeping a close watch on your relationship to Jesus Christ, to being a man of God. You can't keep a close watch on yourself and neglect being a man of God. The first priority of a man of God is to be a godly man but it's very easy for the ministry to keep you from Jesus. <clears throat> when it does, it often looks like this. It was my privilege to become friends with one of the leading Baptists in South Africa in the latter part of the 20th, 20th century, the late Martin Holt. 
Once when I was there, we drove past the, the impressive campus on the hill of an influential Bible college. And as we did, he told me the story of a man who let the ministry keep him from Jesus. I asked him to repeat the story to me in an email, and here's what he wrote. The story I told you about was about a friend of mine who was a principal of a Bible college who, after his fall, came to see me and told me that on the basis of two things, he fell. He had become so busy in the Lord's work that he simply neglected to read the scriptures and pray. So busy, he neglected to read the scriptures and pray. The long-term effects of this neglect, he believes, led to his adultery. When I shared this with, and he named a minister from England who had visited there earlier in the year, when I shared this with him when he was in South Africa, his words to me were, I almost interrupted you before you told me the two things because I wanted to say I knew exactly what they were. In light of discovering them to be true of every known case of ministerial adultery in the UK. And he went on to tell me that a leading theologian in England whose once widely accepted ministry had fallen into disfavor, <clears throat> had fall, whose ministry had fallen into disfavor, admitted to him that he felt he had simply outgrown the reading of the scripture. Keep a close watch on yourself. Don't let the ministry keep you from Jesus. You will be ruined by the ministry if you do. You will also be ruined by the ministry if you don't, as verse 16 also says, keep a close watch on your teaching. And so I plead with you, don't let the ministry keep you from learning. Don't let the ministry keep you from learning. Again, the admonition there in 1 Timothy 4, 16 is keep a close watch <clears throat> on yourself and on the teaching. The Greek word there is didaskalia, which means teaching or instruction or doctrine. What Paul warned all Christians about in 2 Corinthians eleven three is especially true for Christians who are ministers. The New American Standard Bible reads there, but I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. The simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Paul continues in that passage by warning about how false teaching can be the means of leading your mind astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. But on the basis of that, don't think that because of your great theological education here and the biblical foundation that's deepening, that you're permanently immune to false teaching. I have had many friends stray into false teaching after decades of faithful ministry. Because of the internet, social media, there has never been a time where it's easier to be drawn into false teaching than now. Every single day, false teaching reaches out to you, especially on social media, with things that can pique your interest and draw you down a path that eventually has you embracing false teaching. At first, it may not be the explicit teaching itself, but the charisma or the personality of the false teacher or the atmosphere or the ethos or the mood of what's surrounding that appeals to you. And rarely is it just a sudden wholesale acceptance of false teaching, a whole broad range of false doctrine that someone embraces. Usually it's just one or two unorthodox teachings that over time, begins an erosion, leads downward to a significant break from the faith once for all delivered to the saints. 
And this almost always comes to you through someone who initially appears faithful to Scripture in most other things. And because of that apparent general orthodoxy, their false teaching on one or two points seems all the more acceptable. But if you find that any single teaching so dominates your attention that it begins to lead your mind astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ, reject it. So how can you brace yourself against just the unprecedented tide and allure of false teaching in our day, besides limiting your time on social media? The Apostle Paul gives us inspired direction in another of his pastoral epistles, 2 Timothy 3.14. 2 Timothy 3.14, but as for you, continue in what you have learned. Continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. Continue learning what you have already learned from the apostles and from those who have taught you from the doctrines of the apostles, knowing from whom you have learned them. The apostle Paul and the other inspired biblical writers and those you know to be their faithful successors, such as our faculty here and others you know to be faithful successors, those who teach what the apostles taught. Have you learned the doctrine of inerrancy here? Good, continue learning it all your life. Have you learned the doctrines of the person and work of Christ here? Good, continue learning them all your life. Have you learned the doctrine of the Trinity more in depth here? Good, continue learning it all your life. You'll never plumb the depths of such a doctrine. Have you learned the doctrines of biblical manhood and womanhood here? Continue learning them all your life or the cultural pressures will eventually cause you to compromise. In seminary, it's like trying to take a drink out of a fire hydrant sometimes, isn't it? You come out of a Greek or Hebrew class where you're learning to read the Bible in the original languages and, and you come into chapel and you hear often from our, our renowned faculty, you hear from some of our guest preachers who are great preachers from around the country and you, we hear, you know, and when it's not someone like that, who's our fallback guy? It's some guy named Al Mohler who, when he preaches at other places, people drive great distances to hear him. And then you come out of chapel and you go into your next class and it's, it's some of the, the, the best teaching you've ever heard in your life, the best theological and biblical foundation you will ever get. You go to lunch and then you go back to classrooms and sit in places where millions of people across the globe would give sometimes everything they had to be able to sit in the same classroom where you are will be this afternoon. And then perhaps after that, you go to hear one of our many special lectures, like the incredible opportunity you have today and tomorrow to hear Tommy Kidd. And then you eat supper and you go do homework and what do you do? You read some of the most profound books you'll ever read in your life. And you do this for three amazing years. And then you hear your name called in this room and you come up those stairs right there and you walk across the platform and you get your diploma from Dr. Mueller right there. And right there, a transformation happens. And you go from being a person who's been drinking out of a fire hydrant for three years and you go down those stairs transformed into a bucket and the world will drain you dry if you're not replenishing it by keeping a close watch on yourself and on your teaching. It's out of that that you will minister to people the things you have learned in this place and the things you continue to learn through his word. Do it by exactly what Paul says here. Keep a close watch on yourself and on your teaching. And look at the very next words. Look at the very next words in verse 16. Persist in this. 
Persist in what? In keeping a close watch on yourself and your teaching. Persist in this all your life. For, for by this, he says, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for your hearers. I, I don't even have time to address this. And this is one of the most amazing promises in all of Scripture. But you will save yourself, proving you really are saved through doing this through a lifetime. And you will see others come to Christ as the result of the ministering out of that bucket that's being continually replenished. So there's always there food, water for people who are thereby saved. Samuel Hopkins was one of the early biographers of Jonathan Edwards. And he said that when he first met Edwards, he was impressed by a man already 20 years in the ministry had, he said, an uncommon thirst for knowledge. He read all the books, especially books of divinity that he could come at. Now, Jonathan Edwards was the smartest man of any room he ever walked into. He was the best educated man of almost any room he ever walked into. And in the frontier town of Northampton, and especially later at the uh, beyond the frontier outpost of Stockbridge, he could have coasted on his understanding and on his theology for the rest of his life. But to the end of his days, he paid close, very close attention to his life and his teaching. And I hope you will resolve today to do the same. The man's of ministry will not make this easy. I have some very sad news for you. Almost none of you will have more time after you graduate than you do now. And some of you are shaking your head thinking, oh, yes, I will. I won't be studying for tests and writing papers. No, you won't. You'll be in elders' meetings and at the hospital and writing sermons. You'll have more responsibilities, not fewer. You'll have more demands on your time. You'll have a spouse, most likely, if you don't already have one. You'll have more children all than you already have. You'll have more emails and more text messages than now. The issue, as always, is time and your priorities. And your highest priorities of a ministry are here in verse 16. Pay close attention to yourself, and that includes your family. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Don't let the ministry keep you from Jesus. Don't let the ministry keep you from learning. Now, I have two additional ways I want to apply this. First, beware the barrenness of busyness. Beware the barrenness of busyness. The, Constant advances in technology allow us to be more efficient than ever. We can be talking on the phone as we're eating fast food while at the ATM. But not only are we better at multitasking and becoming more productive, along with that, more is required of us. More emails, more texts. And you get more emails and more texts this year than this time last year, right? And a year from now, you'll have more emails and more texts than you get this year, most likely. And that's going to be true for the rest of your miserable life. <laughs> and they require more time to answer them. More social media posts and more hot issues seem to demand more of our attention to be well-informed. More internet videos and podcasts and streaming content seems almost irresistible. So we hurtle through life faster and faster, 
becoming busier and busier. Notice you never talk with another minister. You never talk with someone at church without almost within 60 seconds. One of the two of you talks about how busy you are. In 1999, James Glick wrote a popular book called Faster. And I love the subtitle because it so captured not only everything in the book, but it summarizes so much. The subtitle was The Acceleration of Just About Everything. And that was years before the invention of something that 99% of you have in your pocket or in your hand right now, the smartphone. And so if the pace of life had increased in 1999 to the speed of sound, it's at the speed of light today. And the result is that in our busyness and productivity, we may begin to feel as though we're becoming increasingly efficient at leading shallow lives. But one thing that will always be an exception to acceleration is the rate of growth in godliness. Our faster technology can help, but it cannot hurry the growth of apples and oranges. Neither can it accelerate the growth of a soul, the fruit of the Spirit. Increasing speed of our machines cannot stimulate a corresponding rate of growth of our souls. Faster internet connections do not make us or our people more like Christ faster. The growth of a soul, your soul, and the souls of your people takes time, unhurried time with God. So resist the temptation to believe in, in some sort of microwave spirituality or shortcut Christ-likeness. Beware the barrenness of busyness. Fruitfulness, according to 1 Timothy 4.16, comes as a result of paying close attention to your life and doctrine. Second, finally, immerse yourself in the pastoral epistles. Immerse yourself in the pastoral epistles. If there's a seminary in the Bible, it's the pastoral epistles. The three letters of Paul we've nicknamed the pastoral epistles epistles, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. And notice again what's in the previous verse there. Back in verse 15, practice these things. Immerse yourself in them, Paul says, so that all may see your progress. As I said earlier, these things are all the things Paul's written about ministerial life and leadership in the three pastoral epistles. And notice those words, immerse yourself in them. Unless you take an elective class in the pastoral epistles, I, I suppose you get maybe one, two classes in the pastoral epistles, a New Testament survey, which is necessary in the span of time given. But that's like dipping your toe in the pastoral epistles. Paul says, immerse yourself in them. Since the early 1990s, I've tried to immerse myself in them by reading or listening to one chapter every single day. So every 13 days, I'm reminded of all that their instruction has there for ministers and for pastoral ministry. This has also helped me a lot in terms of doing what the next verse says, paying close attention to my life and to my teaching. Find your own plan, but find a plan. Find a way to immerse yourself in these things. Augustine said that everyone is trying to be happy, but nobody's happy. Everyone wants to be happy. They're trying to be happy, but no one is happy. And there are two reasons for this, he said. First reason is people don't get what they want. They don't get the spouse they want. They don't get the house they want. They don't get the job they want. They don't get the kids they want. They don't get the money they want. They don't get what they want, so they're unhappy. And the second reason, he said, they do get what they want and it doesn't satisfy. And of course, 
He continues by saying it's because God did not make us to be satisfied. There's no one, there is no thing that can fully, lastingly satisfy us because God made us for himself. And he and he alone can fully and lastingly satisfy. And the same is true in our ministries. So be careful what you want in the ministry. Your soul and your ministry, your happiness in that can be satisfied only. In the same way, all people can be satisfied in the knowledge of him through the crucified and resurrected Jesus Christ. And what's true for everyone's soul and your soul and my soul is true in our ministries that only he can satisfy us in the ministry. So don't let the ministry keep you from Jesus. Instead, keep a close watch on yourself and on your teaching. Persist in this and he will satisfy you. Oh, God, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for Jesus. Oh, Jesus, thank you for your willingness to come for such as us. Thank you, Father, for calling us into your service, whether vocationally or in our local church individually. Oh, Lord, what a privilege to serve you. Truly, we would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God and to rule elsewhere. Thank you for this place. Thank you for our leadership. Thank you for our faculty. Thank you for our staff and students. Oh Lord, help us to be faithful to you to the end of our days. Help us all to pay close attention to our lives, our teaching, and to persist in this. We ask all this in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen.